Okay, it's noon. Hello, I'm Sarah Rea, the Executive Director of the Gruber Foundation. I'm going to go ahead and start a PowerPoint here. Take me one second. And welcome to the 17th Annual Gruber Neuroscience Prize, on which we collaborate with the Society for Neuroscience. We present three annual $500,000 prizes in the fields of cosmology, genetics, and neuroscience. While we are here to honor Friedrich Bonhoeffer, Corey Goodman, and Marc Tessier-Levine, let me mention that they join Cosmology Prize recipients Lars Hernquist and Volker Springle, and Genetics Prize recipient Bonnie Bassler on our 2020 roster. Please note that nominations to the 2021 Gruber Prizes are open until December 15th, and that we encourage nominations that reflect the breadth of the fields and the diversity of those working within them. Before we return to neuroscience, I simply must acknowledge our co-founders, Peter and Patricia Gruber, whose combined vision and leadership established the International Prize Program, and whose care in doing so has given it the legs to stand on its own. We are grateful to the Society for Neuroscience for its support of the Gruber Prize, but also for administering the international, yikes, the international uh, research award in neuroscience that we fund. Let me now ask, ask their president, Barry Everett, to present this year's fellows. Dr. Everett. Thank you, Sarah. And it's an honor to introduce the winners of the Peter and Patricia Gruber Award to two outstanding early career scientists, Dr. Hirohiko Inagaki and Dr. Vidya Rangaraji. As a graduate student at the California Institute of Technology, Dr. Inagaki studied how internal states such as hunger or arousal change information processing by the brain. He developed neurotechnology for circuit tracing and optogenetics, and also completed significant projects related to the neural control of feeding in Drosophila. As a Helen Hay Whitney postdoctoral fellow at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Janelia Research Campus, Hirohiko performed groundbreaking mechanistic analyses of short-term memory and movement initiation in mice. His work has shown that the frontal cortex and thalamus form a strong excitatory loop to maintain short-term memory following a network mechanism called discrete attractor dynamics. Dr. Rangaraju studies the role of mitochondria, the energy producing organelles in the brain. She completed her PhD at Weill Cornell Medicine where she developed and applied a novel approach to measuring concentrations of ATP in living nerve terminals elucidating the link between neuronal activity and ATP synthesis. As an Embo and Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt, Germany, Vidya investigated the energy source for protein synthesis in neurons during synaptic plasticity, a mechanism important for memory formation, and her findings showed that mitochondria serve as a local energy supply for local translation in dendrites. It's my pleasure to congratulate these exceptional awardees and invite them briefly to describe their current and proposed research. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Dr. Everett. It's my great honor and pleasure to be a part of this ceremony and receive the prize. I would like to thank my past mentors, colleagues, and collaborators, especially Dr. Keito, Dr. David Anderson, Dr. Sandro Romani, and Dr. Carlos Svoboda. In addition, I would like to thank my family members, SFN, and the Gluber Foundation. I'm a research group leader at the Max Planck Florida Institute, studying neuronal computations underlying diverse cognitive and motor functions. Our behaviors are highly flexible in many different ways, such as in action timing, action selections, and others. The ultimate goal of my lab is to understand how the population of neurons across brain areas change their activity patterns dynamically to support such flexible behavior. To achieve the goal, we develop novel behavior tasks, building cell optical models, and record and manipulate neuronal activity in mice. Thank you.
I'm extremely honored to receive this award that has recognized exceptional neuroscientists. The goal of our research group at Max Planck Florida is to understand how the brain is powered. We address how energy supplies such as mitochondria are locally regulated to generate the energy currency ATP to fuel memory formation. We believe this will help us understand neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and ALS, where the rules governing mitochondrial energy production are broken. I would like to thank my mentors, Professor Aaron Schumann, Professor Timothy Ryan, and Professor Christine Holt for their support throughout my career. I would also like to thank my lab members who have set out on the scientific journey with me, my family members, my late father, my mom, my husband, and our three month old son, who is the only in person audience member here in my home office. Finally, I would like to congratulate the award recipients this year and thank SFN, the group of foundation, and those who are attending this event for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Congratulations to our 2020 fellows. We hope to see you back here someday, maybe receiving your own Gruber Prize. And thank you, Dr. Everett, for joining us on behalf of SFN. Friedrich Wallhofer, Corey Goodman, and Mark Tessier-Levine join an illust illustrious laureate list. They were chosen by our distinguished advisory board, Susan Amara, Francis Jensen, Eric J. Nessler, Anthony Phillips, Angela Roberts, Josh Sains and Carla Schatz. These volunteer advisors bring their priceless expertise and commitment to the selection process, along with an irre irrepressible enthusiasm for science. We could not do this without them. Let me now ask the board chair, Susan Amara, to read the official citation to the prize and add any further remarks. Dr. Amara? Thank you, Sarah. It's a great day, and it's my pleasure to read the um, official prize citation. The Gruber Foundation proudly presents the 2020 Neuroscience Prize to Friedrich Bonhoeffer, Corey Goodman, and Mark Tessier-Levine for elucidating developmental mechanisms that guide axons to their targets, a key step in the formation of neuro neural circuits. Bonhoeffer devised assays enabling isolation of guidance molecules. Using these assays, he discovered that guidance results from a balance between attractive and repellent signals. He then identified key repellent molecules. Goodman pioneered the use of genetic screens in fruit flies to discover gene families controlling axon guidance. Many molecules that he discovered are evolutionarily conserved all the way to humans. Good, uh, Tessier Levine combined evolutionary insights with incisive assays to identify mammalian guidance molecules. His analyses of these molecules and downstream signaling provided insights in, into how growing axons are steered to their targets. I think this is a really, uh, my own comments, I think this is really a wonderful prize. And I think it, it illustrates how coming from very different model systems, individuals can make amazing contributions that actually um, complement each other in ways that I think um, are very clear. So with that, um, Friedrich Bonhoeffer, Corey Goodman, and Mark Tessier-Levine, please join us to receive the prize. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you so much. And before we begin with our recipients, let me tell you the audience, the three honorees will give individual lectures. After the lectures, prize advisors Josh Sains and Carla Schatz will moderate a discussion with them. You may submit questions at any time via the Zoom Q&A function. And with that, I will turn things over, I believe, to Corey Goodman for some preliminary remarks. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Just give me one moment here. There we go. Good. Can everyone see that? I hope so. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. And on behalf of Friedrich and Mark, the three of us really deeply touched and honored. And we want to thank the committee and, and thank the Gruber family. Uh, it's really a deep honor. 
what I'd like to do today is to give a little bit of context for these three talks, to look at a brief history of axon guidance, trying to understand how the brain gets wired up. And um, that history we're gonna go through briefly, but what it's gonna do hopefully is provide a historical context and an appreciation for the talks and the discoveries you're gonna hear from the three of us. And of course, from many other people in the field, this was really a group effort during the late eighties and the nineties. Now begin, as you all know, nerve cells grow by extending growth cones out at the tip. And during the 1970s and eighties, experiments from many laboratories around the world supported the notion that there was a high degree of specificity in axon guidance and target recognition. We didn't know the molecules, but it looked like there was a lot of specificity. But that wasn't the only view. And there were a lot of good reasons why there were some doubters. There were, there were ideas that actually these sorts of molecules were likely not to be very decisive and that you really didn't need them. Um, in the introduction here, I wanna review how we got to that history to what I would consider as opposing views. And of course, what that set the stage for is in the 1990s, the discovery of the initial molecular mechanisms and the logic of axon guidance, that's gonna be the subject of our three talks. Now, of course, like any good story in neuroscience, this one begins with Ramon e. Cajal over a hundred years ago. By looking at fixed material and particularly embryonic material from a variety of different developing organisms, he was the one who discovered the growth cone. And just by observing the fixed material, he had the creative insight to realize in his view that they must be endowed with some sort of exquisite chemical sensitivity because to him, it looked like they knew where they were going. He came up with the notion of chemotactic growth and thought there were actually some sorts of tractive or neurotropic substances that would be guiding them. Harrison came along and invented tissue culture to look at this. And he, he came up with the notion that um, axons grew in the right direction and that there were often pioneers over short distances that laid down the paths that others followed. Now, lest you think that neural development has been a straight arrow of just building up ideas upon one another, uh, the 1930s and 1940s, actually things went in the opposite direction. Probably the dominant intellectual uh, voice in those days was Paul Weiss. And he believed that connections were made largely randomly and that they were functionally validated. He called this the resonance hypothesis. He believed and he concluded that he could decisively disprove the notion, um, Cajal's notion of chemotactic, a, a chemotactic attraction. <clears throat> And he thought there was simply no need for it. Now, and, and for those students who are on this, uh, this morning or today, um, uh, Paul Weiss had a student, a particular graduate student who thought his advisor was simply wrong. That graduate student was named Roger Sperry. Roger Sperry went on to do incredible experiments looking at regeneration of nerve connections. And as most people know, um, he went the opposite of his advisor, Paul Weiss, and he came to believe that there was actually chemical selectivity and that nerve cells looking at the regenerating visual system uh, grew back to the right place. He called this the chemo affinity uh, hypothesis, uh, published that finally in 1963 after actually many years of experiments leading up to it. Now, now lest you think that that simply solved the question the notion that there was chemical specificity, there were naysayers there too. And even throughout the 1960s and 70s, experiments claiming to show that Sperry was wrong. Now, one of the keys I think that happened during the mid to late 1970s was the shift from regeneration to development, to actually look at developing nerve fibers. And what that took were techniques to be able to visualize axons and embryos. In my own case, um, I went to work with Nick Spitzer, who had come out of Steve Kufler's lab. Nick was, at least in my mind, one of the first, if not the first, using Namarsky optics to look at living um, embryonic neurons, in his case, row and beard neurons. He and I did the same with, with embryonic grasshoppers. But there were many techniques like this coming along and was also the time for the emergence of powerful model systems, invertebrates and vertebrates in vivo. And as you'll hear from Friedrich, powerful in vitro models um, to try to recapitulate some of these events of development. Now, lots of labs contributed, lots of people made, a major, uh, made major contributions. There's only really time for a few examples. Let me give you, at least to my mind, a few of the high points. First of all, the notion of looking in the embryo. Um, one of my heroes was a good friend, Mike Bate, who looked in insect embryos, grasshopper embryo at the limb bud and saw there were initially two neurons called the pioneer neurons, 
and they grew into the CNS. And the interesting thing about these was that they didn't just grow straight in. It wasn't as if they were growing to their target from the outset. They went through what he said, an indirect route, a series of stepping stones. The notion of intermediate targets starting to emerge, something Cajal had pointed out with the floor plate. David Bentley's group came along and looked at living growth cones as they made these turns on particular cells and pathways to head to the CNS. Now, some of the anti um, some of the, the anti-sparing notions suggested the time and order were the key determinants. I think Christine Holt really put that to bed, sort of debunking what I would call the notion of simply timing and order with temporal delay experiments. And Chris Doe, when he was a student in my lab, did much the same a few years later, using laser microbeams to delay the formation of certain neurons and showing they still navigated and found their correct pathway. So it, again, looking like we have specificity. Now, one of my heroes, um, as someone who I thought really did a lot of very seminal work was Lynn Lammesser, both with Cynthia Lance Jones and Kathy Tosney and others, showing that motor neurons were navigating through a plexus. They were not just going to their target, they were navigating through an intermediate target, and they had a remarkable ability to find their way and exit into the limb bud in the correct location. Really beautiful work. Um, I'll come back to this later in my own talk, talk, but John Raper, Mike Bastiani, and others in my group did experiments showing what was really quite exquisite specificity, that individual growth cones in a grasshopper could pick out two axons versus about 150 that they had a choice for. Now, within that background um, also came work in tissue culture. You're going to hear about Friedrich's work in a moment, really elegant work trying to recapitulate mapping and the choice of the retina growing into the tectum. There were others doing very similar uh, sort of work in in vitro systems. I just list some of them here. Uh, Andrew Lumsden, other work from Jonathan Raper from Friedrich's lab, uh, Mark working with Jane and, and, and Tom Jessel um, uh, and, and others uh, with Peeney as well. A lot of work coming to the notion that there were really four main forces that were guiding neurons. There were contact attraction, contact repulsion, chemo repulsion and chemo attraction, these four main forces. And I think by the early 1990s, we were all starting to get, to get a sense of this, but um, we still didn't know the molecules. And, and again, lest you think that, it, it, again, it's a straight arrow, um, there were actually naysayers to that notion as well. Um, uh, Jerry Edelman's group had, had cloned NCAM. They had also found NGCAM, it was also called L1. We had the emergence of the first cell adhesion molecules. We also had the emergence of, of people like Carla and others starting to find activity dependent competition and the way activity could refine and prune connections. And those things together really led to a notion um, and Edelman, I think, put it forward um, uh, st strongest that with two adhesion molecules, you could modulate differential adhesion. And with that, you could get enough initial wiring to flip the switch. Now, I think that was inconsistent with what many of us were finding, but it was a strong view. It was a view that influenced many people in the field at the time. Um, uh, now, if I just look at that history, and here's Corey's uh, short form of history. Um, there'll be a quiz on this afterwards. The main thing I wanna show is that it went back and forth, oscillated back and forth, and, and uh, from the notion of specificity to notions of, of lack of specificity. And, and at least in the early 1990s, before we knew anything about molecules, Carla and I wrote a review. I think it was what was on many people's minds. We weren't unique at that point, but thinking that really you could reconcile this um, that you both had molecular mechanisms of guidance and recognition that were going on initially. And then once you got to your target area, you flipped that switch of activity and that controlled the refinement and the remodeling of those connections and made us who we are. Um, now, if that's the case, obviously to settle that debate, one needed to identify the logic and the molecules of guidance. And that's what really unfolded in the 1990s. And that's the topic of today's three lectures. So we're going to begin with Friedrich uh, telling us about how he deciphered the logic and the molecules of guidance, looking at topographic projections, elegant work that he and his group did. Um, then Mark's going to go, and then finally, I'm going to speak. Mark's going to talk largely on getting to an intermediate target, the complexity of that sort of molecular logic. And then I'm going to pick it up and talk about once you get to that intermediate target, why in the heck don't you just stay there? Why do you leave? and the fact that you switch from attraction to repulsion. Thanks very much. I look forward to Friedrich and Mark's talks.
It was a great surprise when I got a telephone call from Josh Saints, middle of June, informing me that Mark Tessilavini, Cole Goodman, and myself were selected to receive the Gruber Prize in Neuroscience 2020. I was, of course, delighted by this decision. It was, for me, totally unexpected because I had already been retired for 20 years and hadn't done any interesting work in neurosciences ever since. I have, however, tried to follow the progress in the field. Let me also say that I'm very pleased with the choice of my two co-recipients. I couldn't be in a better company. I always admired Corey's and Mark's research. I'm deeply grateful to the Gruber Foundation and to Patricia Gruber in particular for this prize. I feel truly honored by the decision of the selection committee. Hopefully my 20 minute retrospect will do at least somewhat justice to the great honor that I have received. Let me start with re-emphasizing the formidable challenge of wiring up the brain. The central nervous system is a biological computer. As such, its functions are the consequence of its circuitry. Modern connectomic studies are beginning to reveal the true complexity of the brain. In contrast to technical devices, however, the fundamental circuits of the nervous system emerge through self-organizing processes during embryonic development. How this all works is one of the most intriguing questions of basic neuroscience. As it has been mentioned, already as early as 1890, Ramon Cajal described the growth con, one of the major players in this astounding process of development of the nervous system. Already he posited that it may be steering the tip of growing axons. Many years later, in the 1970s, I decided to address the mechanisms of neural wiring experimentally, and I chose the retinotectal projection of the chick as my model system. Birds have highly developed visual systems. The embryos are easily accessible, and there's a straightforward retinotectal projection, which connects the retina of the eye to the optic tectum of the midbrain. This connection is paradigmatic for topographic projections, which are characterized by the preservation of neighborhood relationships, and which occur ubiquitously in the nervous system. In the chicken, that we chose to study more than 2 million axons per eye have to find their proper targets, while, except for distortions, preserving the image. In the case of chick, the tactile map is rotated so that the temporal nasal axis of the retina is projected onto the anterior posterior axis of the tectum. As Corey explained in the mid 20th century, Roger Sperry, whom you see here, was the first to do systematic experiments on axon wiring mechanisms. Already he used the retina detector system as a model. He showed that in fish, after a cut of the optic nerve and the partial retinal deletion, regenerating axons ignored the vacated places and grew back to their original sites. After a nerve cut, and the 180 degree rotation of the eye, a recovered newt when following a prey consistently turned into the wrong direction, indicating that the axons had regrown to the original targets. Thus, for the newt, the world was rotated by 180 degrees, as we heard. Sperry hypothesized that this was due to a strict chemical affinity between axons and their targets. This led us to wonder whether his hypothesis could be proven experimentally. 
Together with my superb and long-term technician, Yulita Hoof, we set out to study axon guidance in a petri dish. This is the place to say that without Yulita, her dexterity and her perseverance, many of the, at the time, somewhat crazy approaches would not have worked. In our first experimental setup, shown here, we grew tactile cells on the substrate and put a glass rod covered with retinal cells on top, leaving a narrow cleft. Now our axons growing from a retinal explant had the choice to follow the retina or the tactile surface at the cleft. We found that they consistently followed the retinal cell layers, irrespective of where it was positioned. This demonstrated for the first time that growth cones can read cues on cellular surfaces, a prerequisite for the validity of Roger Sperry's chemo affinity at the end. But could growth cones also make more subtle distinctions? In the experiments shown here, Yulita and I manufactured Y-shaped growth permissive microlanes and put nasal and temporal retinal explants to the ends of the Y arms. And we placed a fluorescently labeled test explant to the base of the Y, temporal axons consistently drawing temporal peers. Interestingly, as you can see here, nasal axons didn't make a clear decision. In fact, they turned out to be less responsive in all our experiments. Temporal growth cones, however, were clearly able to distinguish even subtle topographic labels on other fibers. So the next step was to test whether growth cones could also distinguish similar differences on cells from the tactile target. All our previous guidance assays were experimentally very demanding. And as I already said, would not have been possible without the able hands of Yulita. In order to develop an approach that would lend itself to easier experimentation, we developed the STRIPE assay, which you see in this slide. Together with Jochen Walter, we fabricated a silicon matrix with parallel microfluidic surface channels. Microfluidics hardly existed as a field at the time, but proved for us the way to go to make progress with our questions. We put a porous filter on top of the silicon device and added a drop of suspension of purified target cell membranes. The application of suction deposited the membrane fragments firmly onto the filter above the matrix channels, thereby clogging them. Repeating the procedure with a second type of membrane, but without the channel matrix, generated a second set of stripes. Now axons growing from an explant placed onto such a stripe carpet would have the choice between the lanes with the different membranes. A distinct decision for A lanes, for example, means that axons either prefer A or avoid B. In our case on striped carpets made from anterior versus posterior tactile membranes, we found that temporal axons indeed strictly ruin anterior membranes, the normal biological target. Nasal axons are again less selective. We then treated the posterior membranes with heat or PIPOC, an enzyme that cleaves GPI anchors and found that the temporal axons grow crisscross. Since this was achieved by inactivating the posterior membranes, this demonstrated that the choice was not due to attraction by the anterior, but rather avoidance of the posterior membranes, which seemed to contain a heat sensitive that is most likely proteinaceous GPI anchored repellent. We then went on to address the discriminatory power 
of the growth cones and challenged as seen in this slide, temporal axons with membranes from consecutive tactile fifths. Between the most posterior and the fourth fifth, they prefer the fourth. Between the fourth and the third, they prefer the third, and so on. And th this indicated to us that the growth cone could quite precisely distinguish topographic positions on the anterior posterior axis of the tectum, and most notably that the repulsive activity was distributed as a concentration gradient of the repulsive molecules. These results strongly corroborated the chemo affinity hypothesis, but Sperry's differential affinity was not realized as one may have expected by an attraction, but by repulsion. Why is the concept of guidance by gradients so crucial for axon targeting? One problem with the original idea of chemo affinity is how myriads of targets could be chemically differentiated with only about 20,000 genes. A possible solution is combinatorial coding. Every target could be a mosaic of combinatorial addresses. In this case, however, as you can see in this animation, the growth cone would have to perform an undirected search to find the target. A gradient mechanism is better in this respect. By different concentrations, many different addresses can be encoded by a single queue, and importantly, by its slope, the gradient additionally provides directional information so that the growth cone can navigate more or less directly towards its target. In some way, the holy grail of our work was to identify the GPI-anchored repulsive molecule on the posterior tactile membranes. This panel shows the paper in which Uwe Drescher, at the time a postdoc in our lab, used the proteomic approach and found a distinct candidate spot. When we studied the gene in detail, we found that it was indeed expressed in a graded way on the tectum, and importantly, in the stripe assay, it showed the steering effect. We called the protein RACs for repulsive axon guidance signal. It was more than or less unknown at the time and was later renamed Afrin A5. It turned out to be the first representative of, of a whole family of guidance proteins, the Afrins and their binding partners, the Fs. FA3 was in parallel identified as a graded candidate receptor in the retina by John Flanagan's laboratory at Harvard. Thus, in 1995, we had arrived at a simple model with an FA-mediated sensitivity gradient in the retina and an Fn-A-mediated repulsive gradient on the tectum. This helped to understand how topographic maps could be formed in principle, but it gained textbook prominence a bit prematurely. Prematurely because things are more complicated. There are additional counter gradients of efferents and Fs on the retina and the tectum, respectively. Moreover, it was found by others that in the efferin F system, signaling works in both directions, forward and reverse, as shown here. This then gives rise to up to six signaling interactions. Most of them were experimentally validated in our lab and the lab of Uwe Drescher, and none was attractive. Fortunately enough, though, I got retired at the time. But much to my delight, others took up the torch. Franco Wade and his group, for instance, developed a comprehensive computational model which builds on the six potential 
efferin F signaling pathways on the tectal efferin F gradients, the growth cone will experience fiber target forward and reverse signals. Due to the concomitant presence of Fs and efferins on the same growth cone, cis forward and reverse signaling emerges and by the interaction with other growth cones, fiber fiber forward and reverse signals come into play. According to the model, targeting minimizes the guidance potential derived from these interactions. At the target site, the potential is zero since total forward and total reverse signals are in balance. Or equivalently, since the growth cone has reached a position where the F and F ratio of the surrounding target cells and the growth cones equals its own, it is still uncertain whether the simplistic model is correct, but it is surprisingly powerful. It can not only explain our in vitro results, but also the results of classical regeneration and modern genetic experiments, which revealed an amazing adaptivity of the topographic mapping mechanism. Under suitable experimental conditions, the projection can expand, get compressed, go to a mismatch target, reverse its polarity or get duplicated. Surprisingly, the model reduces all these results just on the basis of Efrin F mediated chemoaffinity. We like to think that our brains are plastic and malleable and largely formed by experience. So genetic hardwiring of major computation architectures of our brains might seem a little naive. But think about the alternative. Here's a set of neurons which indiscriminately forms every possible connection and only secondarily stabilizes favorable ones through experience. With 10 to the 11th neurons in our brain, this would create a wiring catastrophe with everything connected to everything. Additionally, it would require every experience to be made by each individual. Directed hardwiring, in contrast, can be the better and more parsimonious solution. Importantly, it benefits from the experiences that the whole species has made upon exposure to the world over evolutionary time periods. These are inscribed in DNA and re-instantiated during the brain development of the individual. Only then the individual experience dependent mechanism come into play. In this talk, I just alluded to the role of efferents and Fs in axon guidance. As you will hear in the following, there are other important players in guiding axons to their proper targets. But still, it turns out that the genetic machinery of the brain wiring relies on a rather limited alphabet of guidance cues, of which efferents and Fs make up one part. Mark and Corey will in a moment tell you more about the other parts of this amazing system, which has fascinated me for a good part of my scientific life. This concludes my presentation and only leaves me to say thank you to those with whom I shared the scientific journey. First and foremost, I'm extremely grateful for lifelong support of the Max Planck Society to which this sometimes unconventional and daring work only became possible. Secondly, I always cherish the interaction with my fellow Max Planck directors in Tübingen. It was a true pleasure to work in this more stimulating environment. And finally, and most importantly, I'm most grateful to all my collaborators. I credited some of them explicitly during my talk but I'm equally grateful to all those who pursued other exciting projects in our institute, which I could not mention for time reasons, such as Heinrich Bayer, Chi Bin Chen, Suresh Jesus Hassan, Jürgen Leschinger, 
Bernhard Müller, and many more. We helped create an inspiring atmosphere and made our common endeavor a real delightful experience. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Friedrich, for this wonderful talk. Um, I want to start my talk by thanking the Gruber Foundation uh, for awarding me the Gruber Neuroscience Prize together with Friedrich and Corey. I'm both deeply honored and so very grateful. Now, Friedrich has told you how axons are guided once they get to their target region. Corey and I, in our talks, will describe how axons are guided to their target regions in the first place. As you heard, Axons get to their targets by navigating a series of closely spaced intermediate targets. I'll focus on how they get to their intermediate targets, and Corey is going to focus on how they move on from um, their uh, intermediate targets. Now, the first speculations on how axons get to their targets were, of course, made by Ramon y Cajal soon after his discovery of the growth cone, when he proposed that axons are guided by chemotractive substances made by target cells. Cajal has been struck, had been struck by the seemingly directed growth of axons um, uh, over uh, uh, large uh, portions of their trajectories. And he uh, proposed his chemotropic theory, according to which target cells make substances that the axons actively avoid. For example, in the spinal cord, observing the apparent homing of so-called commissural axons to the ventral midline, he proposed that midline cells, um, uh, uh, called floor plate cells, attract the axons um, to the target, um, that these cells make a chemotractant for the axons. As you heard, speculation like this lay dormant for the better part of a century until the development of powerful tissue culture methods that made it possible to demonstrate effects of target targets on axons the most persuasive of which involve culturing pieces of neural tissue containing the cell bodies of neurons together with pieces of target tissue of the right age, which show that the target cells could attract the axons at a distance over a few hundred micrometers. This approach was used to show that target attraction uh, occurred throughout the nervous system and also revealed the opposite type of mechanism, chemorepulsion, in which non-target cells make substances that push the axons away. As one example, in the spinal cord, we used this approach to test Cajal's hypothesis when I was a postdoctoral fellow with Jane Dodd and Tom Jessel, collaborating with another fellow, Marcia Placek, and with the help of Andrew Lumsden, who had first used the approach and showed that Cajal was right that floor plate cells at the spinal cord midline can attract commissural axons. I'll come back to this later. Collectively, such studies and the many other studies you heard about today gave rise to the worldview in the early 90s that Corey showed that axons are guided by four forces chemoattractants and chemorepellents that can function to either short range, as you heard from Friedrich, or at long range, which I'll discuss today. Of course, this was just a theory, and to test the theory, it was necessary to identify the molecular mediators and to determine how they guide axons, which is the focus of my talk. When I set up my own lab at UCSF, um, because no molecules of axon guidance were known, I decided for my colleagues to undertake a systematic search for Cajal's chemoattractants using a functional biochemical approach. That is to say, we sought to reconstruct guidance events in vitro and then use these as bioassays to identify the molecular mediators, either by biochemical purification or by other means. This is similar to the approach Friedrich described, except that we focused on diffusible factors rather than short range factors. We decided to focus on multiple guidance events in and around the spinal cord in the mouse and rat embryos at mid gestation. At that stage, the spinal cord is pear shaped we set out to study the guidance of those commissural axons that I've already discussed to the midline, uh, but we also studied their guidance after they enter and cross the midline and leave to the other part of their trajectory. We also studied the guidance of motor axons to the periphery and of sensory axons both into the spinal cord and to the periphery. We reasoned that by casting a wide net, we might be able to identify multiple guidance mechanisms and to start to tease out the logic of axon guidance. I'll briefly describe some of what we found. 
The first system we studied was the guidance of commissural axons to the midline, where, as I mentioned, as a postdoc, my colleagues and I showed attractive effects on floor plate, of floor plate cells. We did this by cutting out pieces of spinal cord containing the neurons and placing them in culture either alone or together with pieces of floor plate. We found that the floor plate, but not other tissues, could stimulate the profuse outgrowth of commissural axons. We also looked at axon growth inside these explants using a fluorescent marker. You can see that the axons grow, grew straight, but we found that if we put pieces of floor plate over to the side, the axons will turn towards the source. So the floor plate can both promote outgrowth and promote turning of the axons. Now at UCSF, I was joined by two talented postdocs, Tito Serafini and Tim Kennedy, and we decided to try to identify the factor or factors made by floor plate. We weren't able to isolate it from the floor plate itself, which is too small a source, but we found a similar outgrowth activity in extracts of embryonic brain, which is a more abundant source. And we were able to purify the activity uh, in brain extracts using this assay as a bioassay through six steps of purification to homogeneity starting from 25,000 embryonic chick brains. And this showed that the activity is due to not one, but two proteins, which were novel and related, which we called netrin-1 and netrin-2 from the Sanskrit word netr, meaning one who guides. Each of these proteins individually could mimic the activity of floor plate cells. For example, if we engineered cells to make netrin-1, you can see they both promote the outgrowth of these axons and also attract the axons. And although they were isolated from brain, Netrin-1 is made in spinal cord, um, including by the floor plate. And it actually is required for guidance to the midline, since if we look in a mouse embryo, the normal guidance of these axons to the midline is profoundly disrupted when we take away Netrin genetically. And I'll come back to the precise role of Netrin-1 later. But the upshot is that Netrin-1 guides axons to the midline. And this led to a first surprise, because while we were doing this work in parallel, at Hedgecock, Joe Collotti and his colleagues were studying an analogous set of neurons in the lowly round worm, C. elegans, with cell bodies in the top of the worm that project to the bottom of the worm, and they found a protein, unc 6 required for the, their guidance. Remarkably, netrin-1 and unc 6 turn out to be species homologs, showing that the molecules of axon guidance are conserved across 600 million years of evolution. This came as a surprise because at the time, it was widely believed that the mechanisms for wiring of the nervous system in higher organisms would be more intricate than those in simpler organisms. What they showed instead is that the building blocks are the same. They're just put to more sophisticated use in higher organisms. And we went on to co collaborate with Corey Goodman to show that the same is true in the fruit fly, Drosophila. The parallel was even stronger because in worms, unc 6 uh, is required for axons to grow in the opposite direction. And the same is true in vertebrates. We found that axons that grow away from uh, uh, the midline are also guided by netrin-1. In this case, however, the axons are not attracted, they're repelled. This was shown by Sophia Colomarino in the lab who developed an assay in which axons that grow away from the midline, so-called trochlear axons, will grow out spontaneously. But you can see that if we challenge them with cells secreting netrin-1, they had a profound repulsive effect on the axons. So netrin attracts some axons and it repels others. It's bifunctional, a property shared with many, if not all guidance cues. And we can conclude that attraction and repulsion are in the eye of the beholder. This is true for growth cones, just as it is for people. Now, our next set of insights came from our studies of a different guidance events, which is the branching of sensory axons into the spinal cord shown here in red. Quan Hong Wang, a student of the lab, set out to reconstruct this event in vitro. And he showed that extracts of spinal cord of the right age could stimulate the outgrowth and branching of these axons. Again, he couldn't purify this activity from spinal cord, too small a source, but he found a similar activity in fetal brain extracts and was able to purify it and to discover that the activity was due to a large N-terminal fragment of a protein called SLT2, a member of a small family of proteins of unknown function. And he showed that the rec a recombinant version of this protein fragment, but not the full length protein, could uh, possesses the outgrowth and branching activity uh, that was seen in brain extracts. So this showed that slits stimulate axon outgrowth and branching. And this led to another wonderful surprise because at the very same time, Tom Kidd and Corey Goodman's lab identified the slit protein in flies as a repulsive guidance cue. So our two studies together immediately identified slits as conserved multifunctional guidance cues. This conclusion was reinforced as we and others found that slits can also repel diverse axons as well as migrating cells and vertebrates too, and also function in guidance in worms. What was striking about these discoveries was, again, not only that the guidance molecules 
were conserved, but that some of the events that they're involved with are also conserved. For example, Tom and Corey found that in flies, for commissural axons that have entered the midline to leave it, they have to be repelled out by slit. And in the spinal cord, we found similarly that for commissural axons to leave the midline, they have to be repelled out by slit proteins since if we remove all three slit proteins in a slit one, two, three triple mutant mouse, you can see that the axons stall out at high frequency. And this leads me to the slide that Friedrich showed you of the four dominant families of axon guidance molecules, which are conserved across evolution. He told you about the efferins and their receptors. I've told you about the identification of two other families, the netrins and the slits. In the interest of time, I'll just mention briefly that receptors for these factors were identified genetically in worms and flies by the investigators shown here. And that we went on to show that homologs of these proteins and vertebrates function as netron receptors and slit receptors, the latter in collaboration with Corey Goodman. So it's not just the ligands, but also the receptors that are conserved. And later in my talk, I'll briefly mention the slit receptor robo and the netron receptor DCC. Finally, let me say just a few words about the fourth major family of guidance cues, the semaphorins, which Corey will discuss at length. It's a large multigenic family. We collaborated with Corey to characterize the guidance functions of several of them. Uh, we also uh, sought to find the receptors. Our lab and Alex Kolodkin's lab uh, used expression cloning approaches to identify the receptors that bind some of them as members of the neuropillin family. And our lab with Corey's, along with other colleagues, used genetic and biochemical approaches to show that the signaling moieties for these and other semaphorins are members of the very large plexin family. Again, more on this later from Corey. These then are the big four of axon guidance, the netrins, slits, semaphorins, and efferins, which I'll refer to as the canonical guidance cues. They're evolutionarily conserved. And they're used for countless guidance events in all nervous systems examined to date. But as important as they are, it turns out they don't explain all of axon guidance. So now I'd like to say a few words about other factors that collaborate with these canonical cues. In our lab, we came across some of them in our continued studies of other guidance events. You'll recall that we've been searching for an attractant for motor axons made by their peripheral target and an attractant for sensory axons made by their peripheral target. We found that these factors are not canonical cues, but rather two known growth factors, hepatocyte growth factor and a combination of neurotrophins for the motor axons and the sensory axons respectively. And we and our colleagues identified two additional growth factors, stem cell factor and VEGF functioning in the spinal cord. In the labs of Christine Holt, Rudiger Klein, and Sonia Gorel also identified other growth factors as attractants too. These cues appear to be used more sparingly than the canonical guidance cues in select settings and appear to be used mostly for attraction. A third set of guidance cues identified by our lab and other labs are molecules that we think of more traditionally as morphogens, members of the hedgehog, Wnt and BMP families. These molecules, as many of you know, are used at earlier stages of development to pattern tissues, but it turns out they get reutilized later to guide axons. We came across them in our further studies of attractants for commissural axons. Fred Sharon in the lab showed that sonic hedgehog is an attractant for these axons before they cross the midline. I'll come back to this. Yimin Zhu, a postdoc in the lab and work that he started in the lab, but then pursued beautifully in his own lab, identified winds as attractants for these axons after they cross the midline. Separately, the labs of Paula Bovalenta and Jane Dodd implicated hedgehogs and BMPs in repulsion. And John Thomas showed that wints guide axons in Drosophila. So morphogens, like the canonical cues, are bifunctional and evolutionarily conserved too. Finally, a number of other cues have been identified, including by some, some by the three of us today. And I'll come back to some of these cues later in my and in my closing remarks. The question then is, why so many cues and what are their special contributions to guidance? To address this, in the last segment of my talk, I'd like to drill down further into the guidance of commissural axons to the midline and discuss three features of axon guidance illustrated with Netron 1. Multitasking, collaboration, and tight coordination. Let's start with multitasking. It turns out that Netron 1 actually multitasks in guiding commissural axons in interesting ways. Although up till now, I've emphasized the role of Netron 1 made by floor plate. When we initially identified the Netrins, we realized that Netron is actually made in two locations at high levels in the floor plate and at lower levels in the ventral two thirds of the ventricular zone, as shown in this diagram and also in these sections of mouse embryos at different ages. And we proposed that the netron from floor plate might function primarily in the vicinity 
uh, of the floor plate, with other source, the other source of netrin being more important in more distal regions. Over the years, work from our lab and other labs, notably the uh, Butler and Shidatal labs, um, has shown that netrin-1 from floor plate can act over distances of a few hundred micrometers, but that netrin-1 made by ventricular zone cells appears to act more locally. As well, if we look at the distribution of netrin-1 protein, you can see that it accumulates along the edge of the spinal cord in both mouse and chick, and we can even quantify an increasing dorsal to ventral gradient of the protein. And this distribution helps us understand the defects that occur if we take netrin-1 away from the entire spinal cord. So here you see the normal trajectory of the axons. Here you see what happens if you take away netrin-1. And the work of many labs, include ours, has shown that there are first profound defects in the ventral spinal cord, uh, not the floor plate, but there are also defects in the dorsal spinal cord. Axon growth is impaired, some axons grow up rather than down, and some of them plunge out of the spinal cord. Furthermore, elegant genetic analysis by the Butler and Shader Tal labs using deletion of netrin-1 in specific regions of the spinal cord has shown that the defects at the very bottom reflect the action of floor plate netrin. The defects at the top are due to netrin produced locally. And in between in this region, it's a combination, a synergistic combination of locally derived netrin and netrin traveling from floor plate that attracts the axons. Now this diagram summarizes our current understanding, which is that Netrin enriched along the edge helps channel the axons and, and stimulate the growth of their axons ventrally. But when they get to the bulge of the motor column, it's the synergistic actions of local and long range netrin that guides them. It turns out that there are many settings where it's local rather than long range actions of netrins that dominate, uh, as we found in vertebrates in the eye and Alain in the hindbrain, and also in Drosophila and beautiful work by Barry Dixon, uh, the Salaker lab, and by Larry Zapersky which raises the question of what determines whether netrins act locally or at long range. Is it because of the level of netrin expression, the presence of specific binding sites, or some modifications of the protein, as we'd originally suggested, or because of cell type specific secretory mechanisms, as Samantha Butler has suggested, or both? At this point, we don't know. Now, as you can see here, when we take away netrin, um, some axons still make it to the midline. And this leads me to my second theme of collaboration, as we found that netrin-1 doesn't function alone in guidance by floor plate cells. It's assisted by non-canonical cues. We discovered this in our continued studies of commissural axons by floor plate cells, where, as you'll recall, both the floor plate stimulates both the outgrowth and attracts these axons. We wanted to know whether netrin-1 accounts for all of these activities of floor plate cells. We found that it did indeed account for all the outgrowth activity since if we deleted netrin-1 genetically, the outgrowth activity of floor plate cells was lost. But to our surprise, we found that removing netrin-1 did not abolish the turning activity of floor plate cells, showing that there must be a second chemoattractant, which Fred Charon then identified at Sonic, Hedge as Sonic Hedgehog, which can attract the axons, as I've already shown you, but does not stimulate their outgrowth. It's more of a pure attractant. And we found that Sonic Hedgehog accounts for much of the residual turning activity. In collaboration with Sue McConnell's lab, we identified the receptor complex that mediates these actions of Sonic Hedgehog as a combination of these two proteins, which then enabled us to dissect the relative contributions of netrin derived just from floor plate and of Sonic Hedgehog in guiding the axons. We did this using genetic analysis um, uh, with Fred Chiron. I won't go through the details. Let's just skip to the results and look at this region here of the spinal cord as the axons skirt the motor column to the midline. You can see that if we remove just netrin from floor plate or just sonic hedgehog, we see partial defects. But if we remove both, we see much more substantive defects that are actually additive here. So the morphogen sonic hedgehog collaborates with netrin to attract axons. And in a wonderful parallel, Jane Dodd and her colleagues show that different morphogens, members of the BMP family, help guide the axons by repelling them away from the dorsal midline, a nice symmetrical action of morphogens. And just to round up the set, growth factors assist too, as we and our colleagues found that the growth factor VEGF from floor plate makes a contribution to attraction as well. But this is not the entire story. And I'm going to close my talk by telling you about another re repellent that operates in the context of tight coordination of guidance mechanisms. Coordination is my final theme. You'll recall from earlier in my talk that commissural axons <laughs> that enter the midline uh, leave by being repelled out by slit proteins, which we found 
act via the vertebrate robo-1 and 2 receptors. Now, if SLIT is so re repulsive, the question arises how the axons can enter the midline in the first place. This is a problem that Corey will discuss in detail in flies. In our lab, Christelle Sabatier and Zhe Chen found that in mice, a particular roboprotein, robo-3, is key to regulating crossing. Specifically, they found that robo-3 is made by commissural axons as they're growing to and across the midline, as you can see with this green dye. And it blocks their responses to slits, enabling the axons to cross the midline. After crossing the midline, the axons stop expressing robo-3.1, uh, which enables them to send slits and be repelled out. So robo-3.1 is a gatekeeper that opens the gate to midline crossing, which is shown nicely by the fact that if we remove robo-3 genetically, the axons are prematurely responsive to slit and not a single one of them will cross the midline. But this is where things got really interesting because further genetic analysis suggested that robo-3 has additional functions. In fact, it has two. A first, discovered by our collaborator Alain Chiratal, is that robo-3.1 potentiates the attractive act activity of netrin-1 acting by its DCC receptor. A second function was discovered by Alex Jaworski in our lab, who was intrigued by the fact that robo-3.1, although, although it modulates slit and netrin signaling, binds neither slits nor netrins. And he wondered if it has a ligand of its own. So he searched for ligands biochemically using the ectodomain robo-3 as bait and identified the high affinity ligand, a secreted protein called NEL2, and showed that NEL2 activates robo-3.1 to repel commissural axons, as you can see here, cells secreting NEL2 repel the axons. Remarkably, NEL2 is localized to the motor column, this region that the axons avoid. Here you see the NEL2 protein being avoided by commissural axons. And that removing NEL2 enables the axons to invade the region of NEL2 expression, something that we saw originally in a sensitized genetic background, but which Alex and his student, Zach DeLowry, have now observed for pioneering axons, even in a non-sensitized background. So let me put this all together. What I've told you is that Robo3 is an integration node with three functions. First, it mediates NEL2 repulsion from motor column, helping keep the axons out of the motor column. Secondly, it potentiates netrin attraction, favoring the growth to the midline. And finally, it prevents premature repulsion by slits, enabling them to enter and cross the midline. I call Robo3.1 an integration node in the sense that these three apparently disparate functions are actually mutually reinforcing. They all serve the same role of getting the axons to and across the midline. And the finding of this integrative role highlights the remarkable lengths to which the nervous system goes to ensure that the actions of guidance cues are carefully coordinated and that guidance occurs accurately and flawlessly. Let me sum up. Building on Friedrich's presentation, what I've presented is evidence for four dominant families of guidance cues, the netrin slits, semaphorins, and efferins, along with other types of cues that are deployed more selectively and collaborate with these canonical cues to ensure guidance. Many of them are multifunctional. They can be attractive, repulsive, or regulate branching. Some can function at long range, and the range of action can be regulated through still poorly characterized mechanisms. Remarkably, there are also mechanisms that appear specifically designed to integrate and coordinate the actions of multiple guidance systems to ensure accurate guidance. And I also gave you a hint that there are mechanisms for temporal switching of the responsive growth cones, which will be a focus of Corey's talk. So I'd like to close where I started, which is with Ramoni Cajal, who discovered the growth cone, proposed that axons are selectively guided, and that they're specifically guided by chemoattractants. And although he didn't have the full story, I hope that I've nonetheless convinced you that in these predictions, as in so many others, Cajal was right on the money. Finally, I'd like to thank the many members of my lab, along with my mentors and collaborators, who made this work possible, with special thanks to Corey, my long-term collaborator. Apologies to my many colleagues uh, whose work I wasn't able to discuss, both in Axon Guidance and also uh, uh, in other fields, and also to our collaborators whose work I didn't have time to highlight and others in the field. Thank you very much. Great. Um, 
Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Friedrich. Beautiful talks. Uh, it reminds me of just what a wonderful time the 90s were, um, both learning from Friedrich and collaborating with Mark. What I would like to do today is to talk about the work that was done in my lab and work that many of those postdocs did after they left, uh, uh, to, in, in a sense, to really bring clarity on some of the issues. And I'd like to start with the cellular analysis. Very briefly, some of the lessons that we learned in the 1980s to share some of those lessons with you and what really motivated us to turn to genetic analysis. Why we began our first large scale genetic screen in, in 1989, what were the key features that took us there? And for us really, fruit flies were just little people with wings. That was something we were certainly convinced of and it became clear that the, the, the common molecules, the common principles as the 90s unfolded. And as you're gonna see throughout my talk, um, there was a wonderful collaboration in the 90s between my lab at Berkeley and Mark's lab at UCSF, and of course, then he moved to Stanford. Um, and I'll feature that a lot. Now, I'm, I'm going to try to mention lots of people's names in the work. I'm not going to get to mention everybody's, but I'd like to at least highlight some of the key things that were found during that time. First of all, if I go back to the cell biology, lots of interesting experiments students and postdocs in my lab did back in the uh, back in the early to mid 1980s. I want to come back to the one I introduced you to, the work done by John Raper and Mike Bastiani. Now we started, and you can see it on the right, we started with a grasshopper embryo. Um, I have to tell you that even back in my, my days and as a postdoc with Nick Spitzer, we were thinking about Drosophila, but Drosophila embryos are the little handbag here. And I'll come back to that later, how in collaboration with Mike Bate, we made the jump from grasshopper to Drosophila. Grasshoppers have very large transparent embryos where we were able to visualize individual cells and even individual axons and growth cones. And when, when Jonathan, Mike, and I were looking, we focused on a particular cell called the gene neuron. And the gene neuron put out its growth cone. And you can see the first thing it did is it crossed the midline. And when it got to the other side, it picked a particular pathway. That pathway wound up being these two axons of P1 and P2. A third one came across a little bit later. And it joined a bundle that had the two Ps and the two As. And what was remarkable was Jonathan then went and ablated those cells, the two Ps, the two As, all sorts, you know, others. And what he found, he and Mike found, were remarkable specificity, actually shocking at the time, I think, to many people. What he found is that if you ablated P1 and P2, the G growth cone got over to the other side, extended broad philopodia, and never chose another pathway. Now, it was hard for us to reconcile that with notions of simple differential adhesion, with notions that there was a hierarchy of adhesion, because surely it should have picked another pathway, but it did not. In fact, at the time, Jonathan around the lab used to talk about turn-ons and turn-offs, used to say there had to be something more complex here, something that was controlling that degree of exquisite specificity. We went looking, and we went looking by large, huge preparations, membrane preparations of embryonic nerve cords, making monoclonal antibodies, screening. A lot of people in the lab were involved, particularly, I'd call out Nipon Patel, Mike Bastiani, Alan Harrelson, Peter Snow, and, and others. And we found a series of molecules that were indeed on subsets of axon pathways. We called them fasciclins. They were on fascicles. Here I show fasciclin one and fasciclin two. And what's interesting in this picture is that they were actually on specific pathways. There were a couple of take-home lessons that were interesting back at this point in the 80s. And the first and what's shown on the right is that these molecules were regionally expressed. You don't have one molecule covering the entirety of a, of a neuron, nor is that one molecule gonna be on different growth cones of the same neuron. Rather, here you can see fasciclin 1 is expressed on these axons in brown as you come across the midline. Once you get to the other side, these neurons don't stop there. Rather, they turn up or down in a longitudinal pathway. Some of them turn on fasciclin 2, where they enter one of four broad FAST2 positive pathways. So axon pathway labels, labels were regionally expressed here with midline seeming to control that. Secondly, it wasn't one molecule, one pathway. They were on different subsets of pathways. Something here must control the anterior from the posterior commissure if you express FAST1. Down here, they're on four out of perhaps 20 different bundles longitudinally. 
Now we went on and cloned those molecules. Many people involved, I've listed the key ones below. Three of them were members of the IG superfamily amongst the very first in invertebrates showing the commonality in the, the evolutionary ancient property of molecules with immunoglobulin domains. The, the other one, fasciclin one, defined a new family. These were all cell adhesion molecules, homophilic cell adhesion molecules, FAST1 is now known, that family is conserved from lower organisms all the way up to humans. But then Alex Kolodkin and David Mathis found a different one. What we called fasciclin 4 became the first member of the semaphorin family, sema 1a. And what Alex and, and, and David found was that this molecule also was expressed on a subset of pathways and in interesting locations in the epithelium. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, we used that, Alex and David used that to essentially crawl across different insect species to clone the same molecule in Drosophila. And what they found as they defined the semaphorin domain, what was common, what was homologous, they found that there were multiple molecules in Drosophila, both transmembrane and secreted. And that definition of that domain allowed them to quickly jump to mammals and human, there are viral sequences. It's quite a complex family shown here on the top. Now, what does it do? Um, David Mathis uh, went on to show that in fruit flies, actually, it could behave, uh, these could function as repellents. I'll come back to that in a, in, in a moment, how they function. And we went on with both Mark and Carla's lab to show that one of them here, semaphore and three, could function as a selective chemo repellent for spinal cord, for sensory axons. Now, the question was, what are the receptors? And Mark's um, introduced you to these, and I'll just mention it, that Mark's group and Alex Kolodkin's group found that the neuropillins are co-receptors for the class three semaphorins. Um, we found in collaboration with a group of people, with Mark's group, uh, Meg Winberg in my lab, with Melanie Spriggs at Immunex, and with Luca Tamagnone in Italy, we found that there's actually a family of plexins um, all throughout phylogeny that are involved in for most of the classes, if not all of the semaphorins. Now, for example, in fruit flies, there are five semaphorins and two plexins. In mammals, there are more like 20 or so semaphorins and something like eight, nine, 10 plexins. It looks like nine in humans. So you get a sense of the size of these families. Now, if I go back to what I mentioned in the introduction, remember the pair of pioneer neur neurons that Mike Bate had initially discovered and that uh, David Bentley's lab had worked on. Well, we collaborated with David Bentley's lab, uh, with Tim O'Connor in specific, and we found that semaphorin 1A was, was expressed on a stripe, on a stripe right where those growth cones made their turn. Tim and Alex on their own went on to show actually that semaphorin 2A, a secreted semaphorin was expressed there. And the notion that one of these semaphorins 2A was a repellent pushing the growth cones from behind Whereas SEMA 1A, at least initially, was an attractant, it begs the question, if you go to that stripe, why do you leave it? Come back to that in a moment. Now, you look at this and you say, well, that's great. Two of these semaphorins are functioning for, for Bates pioneer neurons, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There must be many different mechanisms and molecules, how you go from stepping stone or intermediate target to intermediate target. And the question is, how can you dissect the mechanisms for any one guidance decision? How do you get that logic and really understand it? And that's what led us to Drosophila and to genetics. We were struck that these pathway labels and molecules we discovered, many of them played interesting functions, but on their own, they were not sufficient to explain any one complex guidance decision of going to and then leaving an intermediate target. And the question for us in the mid eighties was how to get there and for us, the obvious answer was genetics. We already were prefiguring that, that in collaboration with Mike Bates Lab, uh, John Thomas and Mike Bastiani, Mike and I made the switch from grasshopper to Drosophila. Here even showing you that the, the G growth cone that goes with the P1 and P2 in grasshopper, it does the same thing in Drosophila. Remarkable conservation, even of the cell biology. Our first screen was for midline guidance. Now, our, our role models, we had heroes in, in the fly world. On the one hand, Seymour Benzer and all the incredible work he had done with screens. And on the other hand, Yanni Nusslein and Eric Vishaus. Yanni and Eric had looked at the outside identical patterns to, uh, to come to understand the logic of pattern formation. We had antibodies. In this case, you're looking, this is a whole fruit fly embryo. And you can see all the axons in the embryo, the commissures and the longitudinal tracks using an antibody. And we figured if we could visualize it, we ought to be able to saturate the genome and find all the key genes that control those events. 
And what we were looking at was these commissures, 90% of the CNS neurons cross the midline, cross only once, and then turn either anterior or posterior in a particular pathway, like I told you about G. 10% never cross the midline, they just project on their own side. And so the answer for us was we would do large scale screens, we began that in 1989 in Drosophila with the idea and the hope that these things would be homologous, that we would find the same genes in mouse and human, understand the functions in mammals, and ultimately they would have implications for disease. And Mark, at the end of the conclusion, will come back to, I think, disease implications of all the things you're hearing about today. But let's start with, with these screens in Drosophila. I'm going to be telling you about this screen that was done by Mark Seeger and Guy Tier and Dolores Ferris Marco. I'll cut, that's what I'm gonna spend a lot of time telling you about. Let me mention that around the same time, shortly thereafter, after, David Van Vactor with Doug Fambro and Helen Sink did a screen in the lab also for motor neurons growing to muscle. No time to talk about it today. I think the two star genes and Herman Aberley went on to really show this relationship was that sidestep is the ligand, beat is the receptor um, and uh, Tag Pipes worked a lot on beat as well. And, and they start an interesting understanding of motor axon guidance. Um, a group of people starting with Hong Wan and ultimately Herman Aberley, Dorit Parnas and Brian McCabe did a screen for synapses that grow too big or too small. And how do you control synaptic, synaptic growth and the size of synapses? No time really to tell you about that today. Let's come back and focus on the midline. Now here's the G neuron. This is what it looks like in an adult like any other neuron, it's complicated. It actually has multiple axons and has complex dendrites. And we could say, what would we hope to get out of this midline screen? Well, the first question is what cues guide axons to the midline? And why do some grow there and some don't? 90% grow, 10% don't. Second question, once you get to the midline, if it's so goddamn attractive, why don't you just stay there? Why don't you leave? Why do you move on? Um, and once you've left, why do you never come back again? We'll deal with that. And third, once you get across, how do you pick a pathway on the other side? And keep in mind that the pathway you're going to be picking on the other side um, that you actually ignored on your own side. And remember what Christine Holt and Chris Doe taught us. This is not some just controlled by exquisite timing and order. So these growth cones are growing past pathways on their own side that they will ultimately find positive and they grow on on the other side. And of course you have a homolog that's coming right across the midline to do the same. And if you think those questions are hard enough to tackle, imagine this one neuron that after its primary axon grows up towards the brain here, it puts out dendrites, growth cones on either side following yet a different pathway, homologous on both sides, and later on puts out another axon growth cone that follows yet a different pathway. Whew. Pretty complicated for just a single neuron. Now, we did the screen. Mark Seeger, as I said, with Guy Tier and uh, Dolores Ferris Marco, a fantastic technician. She now has a PhD in her own lab back in Spain. We did the screen and, and we think we came near saturation. And let me tell you what we got and what we didn't get. We got hundreds of different mutations that affected the commissures. And there's probably still an incredible wealth of interesting genes there, but we focused. We had certain controls. We knew we would get things like single-minded and indeed we did. They controlled the fate of the midline cells. Um, but let's, let, let's, let me first talk about what, what you've been hearing about from Mark. We did the screen. We did get alleles of, fra of Frazzl, the DCC receptor. We got two of them. We went on to clone that in collaboration with Yunung and, and Lily Jan's lab. Um, we didn't get, we did not get Netrin. Now, why is that? Well, the, the, the question is, you have to always be careful about what do you get in a genetic screen. And what you won't get is anything where there's true redundancy. In a fruit fly, there are two tandem netrin genes. For the midline, they have the same function. For motor neurons and muscle, they've diverged with different functions. We later, uh, Kevin Mitchell and Barry Dixon, uh, went on to delete both of those, a lot of work with them, but we got zero alleles of netrin, two of frazzled. But the three stars I wanna focus on that really opened up guidance for us were commissureless, roundabout and slit, and let me turn to those. Here are the phenotypes, and you can see how dramatic they were. In the mid middle here is a wild type. In commissureless, nobody crosses the midline. In a complete knockout of commissureless or calm, it's a complete, it's a sperry split brain. Nobody crosses the midline. In roundabout, not only does everybody cross, and you can see the cartoon on the bottom, everybody crosses, 
But once you cross, you like it and you keep going back and forth. In fact, you make circles and whirls around the midline. You cross and recross. And in slit mutants, everybody goes to the midline and they never leave. You simply have all the axons congregating right at the midline. Now, I'm, I'm not going to walk you through a lot of genetics, but something that Tom Kidd did with, with the help of Kim Bland is so beautiful. For those of you who will follow me for a moment, I want to just show you it, 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 the, the beauty of genetics. Here's the roundabout loss of function. Take this away and they go round and round in circles. Add back copies, multiple copies, and the roundabout or robo gain of function looks just like commissionless. Nobody crosses the midline. Reciprocal gain and loss of function. Well, let's do the same with COM. Take it away, nobody crosses. Add back a copy of COM, everybody starts crossing and recrossing. And here's where Tom really had an amazing insight. Add back multiple copies, and when you get back to three copies, it looks just like a slit mutant. Now, I don't expect you to make the leap of faith, but I'll tell you the leap of faith that Tom made at that point. Um, and, and I think everyone in the lab was convinced. First of all, he hypothesized slit was gonna be the ligand for robo, and I'll tell you, in fact, of course it is. And secondly, that because slit is a stronger phenotype than robo, that there were likely to be multiple robo receptors, and indeed there are. And so let's start with roundabout or robo. You've seen that in robo, many axons are going to circle around the midline. It got called roundabout because, you know, I had a lot of Brits in the lab and it reminded them of those driving circles back home. Um, when we cloned roundabout, it looks and, and it winds up functioning like a receptor and quickly we found there's a family. There are indeed three of them in Drosophila. Corey Bargman's lab found the homolog, a single one in nematode. And with Mark's group, we found several in human. Initially, robo one and two, Mark's told you about robo three. There's also an outlier called robo four. Very interesting, no time to talk about. So there are multiple robo receptors from flies to human that share a lot of conservation. How is robo expressed? Interestingly, it's very reminiscent of what I showed you about fasciclin 2 from our earlier studies. That in this case, if you're an axon that crosses the midline like 90%, you don't express it on your surface. It's only once you cross the midline that you turn robo up. This is with an antibody. The brown is the expression of robo, and you see how it's largely missing in the commissures, but expressed very heavily in all the longitudinal axons. Now, if you're one of that 10% that never crosses the midline, you express robo from the outset, outset, and sure enough, you don't cross. So robo one, just like fast two, is somehow downregulated, regionally expressed after you cross the midline. Fascinating, we'll come back to that. Now, we did go on to show that slit is the midline repellent for robo. Uh, Tom Kidd and Kim Bland in the lab showed that, and we collaborated with Mark's group, with Katya Bros and others in Mark's group, to show that it actually was conserved and the binding was conserved from flies up to vertebrates. And again, Corey Bargman's lab went on to show the same thing in, in, in nematode. I should mention that Slick was initially cloned by Spiros Artavanus Siconis. And his lab and my group collaborated and we knew that it was somehow involved with commissural axon pathways. We didn't know how. This is what really brought it together to say that indeed it is the major midline repellent. So here you see both then. You see the midline repellent heavily expressed at the midline and the key receptor, the repulsive receptor, robo-1. And as Mark has told you, Hua Long and others in Mark's lab um, went on to show in a collaboration, Hua had started in my lab and moved over to Mark's, went on to show that in fact, there are three slits in vertebrates. When you take all three away, you get a phenotype that looks a lot like slit in, in flies that everybody collapses at the midline. Now, the midline cells are secreting netrin and slit. We went on and cloned, as I told you, the two netrin genes, Barry Dixon and Kevin Mitchell in my lab in collaboration with Mark largely did that. Same cells are expressing netrin and slit. And, and again, I'll go back to Christine Holt and Chris Doe. It's not about timing, it's about how you respond. As Mark said, it's in the eye of the beholder. So first of all, the genetic analysis told us there must be other attractants. I'll come back to that. Um, Netrin alone uh, didn't have a complete phenotype. And what the heck does commissulus do? Com seems key. Some people suggested maybe com was the other midline attractant. Well, it's not. And here's what com does. And to make a long story short, um, what we found was that commissulus is involved in down-regulating robo. 
The role of commissulus is a transmembrane protein that's involved in keeping robo off the surface. We cloned it. It was at the time a novel protein. Nothing initially in, in, in vertebrates looked like it. People wondered whether it was just a, a quirk of flies. I'll show you that, of course, is not the case. Um, Guy Tier, after he left the lab, went on to show that, that uh, COM binds to NED4, a ubiquitin ligase, leads to the suggestion that perhaps it's leading to the ubiquination of robo. And then Barry Dixon, after he left the lab, went on to do a really beautiful study to bring this together. And what Barry showed, and I, I take his summary diagram here, is that if you are going to cross the midline, the commissulus is a transmembrane protein that in the Golgi is sorting robo out and sending it to the endosome. And so if you're going to cross the midline, you have this intracellular mechanism where you suppress robo. Once you cross, COM goes off, and now you release and robo pops to the surface. If you never cross the midline, COM is off in the beginning. Beautiful work. Now, just very briefly, the robos. Mark's already told you in mammals that robo-3 has this interesting role. Well, I'll tell you that the Julie Simpson in my lab had already started to learn that robo-2 was different. And again, I won't dwell on the genetics, but it had this, these funny properties where we concluded that as you were heading to the midline, it was somehow inhibiting robo. And once you crossed the midline, it too became a repulsive receptor. Well, Greg Bashaw, former postdoc, went off on his own, brought clarity to that, and he showed that in flies that um, robo-2 in trans could actually downregulate robo function as you're heading to the midline, whereas once you cross the midline in cis, it becomes yet another repulsive receptor. Now, we learned, and I'm just going to mention just very briefly, that slit robo, just like semaplexin, can be attractive and repulsive. Mark's lab had found it could be a branching factor. Um, we found it. Uh, uh, Surya Kramer in my lab showed this. Sunita. And um, Tom just brought clarity to this in his own lab. Tom Kidd showed that there's a specific protease cleave slit. The full length in a fly is the repellent. The N-terminal fragment is a growth promoter or attractant that's actually needed longitudinally. Now, let me come back and with my final thoughts about these robos. There are three of them. And here you see what Julie Simpson found and how they're expressed. Barry Dixon uh, found the same thing. A very, a very convergent work here. They're expressed robo one on all the axons after you cross, robo three on the middle and lateral, and robo two on just the lateral. And in fact, we found no time to show you the details that they function that way. As you take them away and add them, you can send, these send the axons either more medially or more laterally. And Mark found the same thing with Hua in, uh, in, in vertebrates. And it begs the question we come back to, um, for example, with FAST2, I told you a marker like FAST2 is on four different bundles. How does a growth cone that expresses FAST2 know which bundle? Well, we were able to show, Julie was able to show that in fact, as you change the robo expression, you will change where they go, but they will go to one of those other FAST2 bundles. So robo is controlling, robo and slit are controlling medial lateral and the combination of short range and long range is doing which pathway you pick. How about the other axes? Well, in terms of dorsal ventral, Mike Bates' group went on to do a beautiful study showing that the semaphorins and plexins, two of the semas, two of the plexins are involved there. And as Mark told you, um, the wind pathway seems to be doing anterior posterior, shown by both John Thomas and Yi Min Zhao. Now, let me just finish up and summarize. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I've told you there's conservation of, you know, in terms of the mechanisms. Both uh, Tom Kidd and, and Greg Bashaw have shown that there are COM-like molecules in mammals, which are doing much the same thing of regulating, keeping robo off the surface, sending it to the endosome. We find there's extracellular mechanisms in flies and worms, complex regulation. There's also gene expression regulation that Guy, uh, Greg Bashaw has gone on to show in terms of the cytoplasmic domain of DCC or frazzled, actually turning up the expression of commissionless, complicated, and no time, and, and Tom Kidd showing this, the proteolytic cleavage, and people have found, I'm not going to go through it, there are other semaphorins at the midline as attractants, as repellents, lots of receptors, lots of regulation, lots of room for people to make further discoveries. So let me just summarize. What did we learn from those initial mutants? Well, we learned that Cajal and Sperry were right. There's molecular specificity. That we learned it's one step at a time, going back to Ross Harrison and, and to Mike Bate, that you're going through intermediate targets, one step at a time. It's dynamic. Once you get there, you move on, 
What controls that? It's largely switching from attraction to repulsion. The control of the repulsive receptors seems to be key. You got to keep them down and then let them go. There's a lot of mechanisms of regulation, and then you have long range and short range. It's in the eye of the beholder. I've tried to mention lots of people's names. If I, for all of the great people in my lab, if I left you out, sorry, there's just so much wonderful work. Key collaboration with Mark's group, of course, and I want to give special thanks to everyone. It was a real team effort. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Corey. Um, I'd just like to close um, the, these uh, presentations with some additional perspectives and a look to the future. But first, let me summarize. The three of us have described how axons are guided by four major families of guidance cues, the netrin, slit, semaphorins, and efferins, canonical cues, together with a variety of other families of cues that assist them in this task. Several general principles have emerged and have been highlighted today. They include that many cues are evolutionarily conserved and multifunctional, that they can function at short or long range and in gradients. The cues collaborate and their actions can be tightly coordinated. And switching mechanisms, as you just heard, enable axons to reprogram their responses to move on from intermediate targets. In looking to the future, I'd like to highlight just a few additional points. First, if we broaden the aperture beyond axon guidance per se, a major finding in recent years is that the canonical guidance cues, which were initially identified in axon guidance, have a broad variety of functions um, uh, in nervous system development and function, including neuronal migration, axon branching, synaptogenesis, neuronal and axon degeneration, uh, and synaptic modulation and plasticity. In addition, they've been implicated in driving and regulating the development, physiology, and pathology of a variety of non-neural tissues, including in patterning the vascular system, in organogenesis, in immune cell differentiation and function, and even in cancer. So the molecules of axon guidance have an impact well beyond the field of axon guidance. Coming back to axon guidance per se, while much has been learned, there's still much that we don't understand, even in the well-studied systems like the ones that the three of us have discussed today. We know that additional cues collaborate uh, with, uh, that we don't already know, uh, remain to be discovered. As just one example, in the spinal cord, lots of indirect data suggests that there's a repellent in the ventricular zone um, uh, that uh, keeps axons out of that region, but we haven't so far been able to identify it. There are also other important regulatory mechanisms that remain mysterious, including one highlighted by Corey. Although we know a lot of what switches at the midline, as you just heard, we still don't know what triggers the switch when axons get to the midline and triggers them to go from this state to that state, despite huge efforts in many labs to identify that midline switch. And then there is the question, why so many cues? In some cases, it's very understandable how uh, there might be mutual reinforcement, but in others, it's less so. For example, at the mammalian midline, we've identified two classes of repellents, uh, slits and semaphorins, as well as a growth factor, all of which affect post-crossing axons. And Valery Castellani has identified a role for a different fragment of slit. Why so many? It seems they have specific roles, but in many cases, we have only a tenuous understanding of the precise contributions. Furthermore, as the field ident identifies additional collaborating cues, we can hope for the occasional surprise, mechanisms that are qualitatively different from those we're familiar with. An example of the unexpected is DSCAM-1 in Drosophila, studied by Larry Sapersky and his colleagues, that can exist uh, in thousands of isoforms and where individual neurons have their own personal DSCAM code that is used to ensure um, that di bran different branches from a given neuron can recognize one another and avoid bundling together. And a similar mechanism appears to exist in vertebrates using different molecules. Another area of great progress for the field, which we weren't able to discuss today at all, 
are the mechanisms through which attractive and repulsive signals are transduced in the growth cone. Huge progress is being made in elucidating the structures of the cues and receptors and how the signals activated at the growth cone surface are then transduced inside the cell to influence growth cone behavior. And again, unexpected mechanisms have surfaced, including control by guidance cues of local protein translation in the growth cone as shown so elegantly by Christine Holt and her colleagues. And finally, much of our focus today has been on the remarkable conservation of guidance mechanisms across evolution. The traditional way we've exploited this conservation is by swapping insights between organisms about what's conserved. For example, the robogenes, um, as you heard, um, uh, the initial insights came from flies that robos are slit receptors. And this led to the discovery that the same is true uh, for some roboreceptors in mammals, as we showed in collaboration with Corey Goodman. But the unexpected discovery uh, that mammalian robo-3 does not bind slit led to the discovery of alternative functions of robo-3 that I told you about at some length as well. Here, evolutionary analysis by our collaborator, Alain Chirotal, showed that the ability of robo-3 to bind slit was lost at the diver divergence between mammalian and non-mammalian species, helping explain aspects of brain evolution um, that occur at that junction and functional differences in brain organization. So going forward, we can expect equally robust insights to come from showing how subtle adaptive changes in either, gu either guidance molecules themselves or how they're deployed lead to changes in neuronal wiring between related species, helping to understand the emergence of specific sensory, motor, and cognitive functions. And we can expect this will be true, not just for model organisms, which have been the focus of our talks, but for humans as well. Indeed, this is already the case, since studies over the past decade have revealed inherited defects in midline brain wiring in humans, including slit brain and mirror movement syndromes in families carrying mutations in the netrin, DCC, and robo-3 genes. So what started as a fascination with how the brain gets wired up is now helping us understand how the brain functions and contributing to the very human quest to understand ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you to our laureate lecturers. We'll now go into the discussion portion. Our discussion moderators are Josh Sains, the Jeff C. Tarr Professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology and founding director of the Center for Brain Science at Harvard University, and Carla Schatz, the Sapp Family Provostial Professor of Neurobiology and Biology, and the Katherine Holman Johnson Director of Stanford BioX. We at Gruber are fortunate that both serve as advisors to the Neuroscience Prize, and I remind attendees you may submit questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. Thank you. Um, well, perhaps I'll start, uh, if I may. I assume people can hear me. Um, first, thanks to all three of the laureates for just absolutely outstanding lectures um, and wonderful coordination that really shows the way in which your work uh, fed uh, upon each other's work uh, to really come up with an elegant picture that if it hasn't solved a big piece of developmental neurobiology, has just made uh, incredible progress on an area that when I was a graduate student seemed unimaginably complex and essentially insoluble. Let me start with a question to Friedrich. Um, I know that um, you began, Friedrich, um, studying DNA uh, and particularly DNA replication. And when you took your faculty position in Tübingen, you uh, continued uh, along those lines uh, with great success for many years. Um, and then uh, from what I can tell, you made a very abrupt and dramatic switch, uh, ceased publishing for several years while you reoriented and then went into this incredibly different and new area. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about uh, how this change came about and maybe also whether um, you encountered any uh, professional issues with your employer as you made this change. Start and first of all, first of all, by saying what it was, what the reason was not for changing, and uh, 
it was not a lack of interesting unsolved questions in the DNA replication, of course. And it was not a lack of recognition by my colleagues in the field. And it was not a lack of friends uh, within the field. A number of friendships which I made at that time survived until today. For example, Toto Oliveira and his family is still a good friend of ours. It was, and now I come to the reason why it changed, it was the increase in number and size of laboratories dealing with similar problems. I felt that the field of uh, DNA replication was too crowded. And so I thought one should perhaps look for something else. I looked for a change. At that time, the field of neuroembryology seemed very interesting and was still not too crowded. That has changed meanwhile, maybe. There was some risk, of course, but at that time I had already a permanent position at the Max Planck Gesellschaft, and so it was not only my risk, it was their risk as well. <laughs> and um, in addition, I had already made much earlier a riskier move from nuclear physics, where I got my PhD, to DNA replication, and that worked quite well. So that was the reason why they had to do that. Thanks so much. I have some questions for uh, for Corey Goodman, but before I ask uh, my question, I want to uh, congratulate all three laureates. Uh, and also especially thank you so much for the beautiful uh, perspectives that you've given us all today. And I, I would like to tell people who are watching that we are lucky these talks uh, have, are being recorded and they are available on the Gruber Foundation website. So uh, we'll be able to use them and watch them many times and I guarantee you I will. Corey, I wanna, I wanna take you back and, and really, uh, ask you, I mean, you gave us this very beautiful thumbs up, thumbs down sort of review mm -hmm. of the uh, intellectual logic of thinking about uh, axon pathfinding and guidance. But I want to take you back to when you started your screens and the decision you made, um, the, which I think was a very risky decision at the time to uh, uh, first of all, study invertebrate guidance, and secondly, to jump over to Drosophila. I mean, you told us you did it, but remind us about the situation when you made your decision and what kind of challenges, methodological challenges even, that you were facing at the time. And I know we don't have enough time, but you know how you overcame one or two of those. It's, uh, thanks, Carla. And, and thanks to you and Josh for, for your, your, your warm comments. Um, you know, when I think back on those times, Carla, I, I, I think of my role. I had this incredible group of students and postdocs, and it was kind of, it was the environment. We all, I think, together came to the notion that we needed um, to take this genetic approach. It was something I had wanted to do for a long time, but so did the, the people in the lab. And my role had to be a little bit of cheerleader because people would come and visit the lab at times and would turn to people in the lab and say, uh, visitors would come and say, why are you doing this? You're never gonna find anything, or this is an evolutionary dead end. And one can lose sight of that now with all the similarity of genome sequences and the way these genes go back and forth. But um, uh, uh, I certainly had to play a role. It, it was a group effort to keep our spirits up and to believe um, that we really were gonna help to pick things apart. I even remember somebody, I won't name names, very famous, uh, coming through the lab and sitting down with me and saying, well, um, and I, I've teased Mark about this over the years, said, well, Mark's in the purifying this thing and you should give up on your midline screen and just do the uh, motor neuron screen. And I think those of us working in the field, and come on, Carla, you know, you, you were part of that as well, Carla, we sensed it was just much more complicated. It wasn't gonna be one molecule solving any guidance decision. Um, and so we persevered. And, and as I say, the role models, 
you know, I mentioned them, having Seymour and Yanni and Eric, the role models of screens and flaws that had been done before uh, convinced us it was possible. And uh, Thank you. Hey, Josh, I think you might have another question. Yeah, why don't I ask Mark a question here and, and go back to, you know, what we, Carla and I have both said that, uh, you know, there have been huge strides made in uh, understanding uh, the development of the nervous system and how circuits are assembled um, over the past few decades. And of course, there's much left to learn. Uh, everybody pointed that out. Um, but I'd like to ask you sort of moving beyond development uh, and regeneration, what do you think are the areas in which uh, there are both the biggest unsolved questions uh, and the new tools that would allow us to answer them over the next few decades? In, in the context of development of the nervous system? Josh? Oh, outside of the context of the development of the nervous system, moving beyond that. Oh, to, to um, uh, brain function. To the brain, the grown up brain in general. Right, well, the, the um, uh, first of all, I, because I can't get away from development too much, um, the, I have a passion for the field of plasticity, um, where, which Carla, of course, uh, has been a pioneer in studying. That is the rearrangements of connections that can occur uh, as a result of uh, experience. Of course, there are rearrangements that occur in pathology if the nervous system is damaged, um, but there are some that occur uh, as well um, uh, as part of, of normal physiology. Um, and uh, uh, we know that a lot of this occurs soon after birth during a critical period. Again, Carl has been a pioneer in studying that. Uh, it's been exciting that over the decades, there's evidence for such rearrangements in the adult as well. Uh, and that's uh, an area where I think there's a lot of promise to understand how it is that axons normally can grow and retract in the adult, because if we can leverage that kind of information, it might be, um, uh, uh, we might be able to use it to try to stimulate repair uh, of uh, the nervous system after things like stroke. So, so first, continuing to understand um, uh, uh, mechanisms that are operating in, in the adult nervous system uh, for modification of circuits. Of course, the, the whole field of neural degeneration uh, is uh, a, a huge one where there, again, uh, uh, genetics, human genetics over the past decade uh, has really helped open the door by identifying many different genes um, that are uh, either causal or risk factors for diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, and that are, as we understand the genetics better, we're starting to understand better what goes wrong cell biologically to, and that's providing points of intervention. So I think uh, in terms of the, the adult uh, from a hardware point of view, if you will, uh, understanding how circuits are modified and what goes wrong in neurodegenerative diseases uh, of course, uh, are, are areas that are, are just so exciting right now. There's the whole field of understanding um, how uh, circuits control behavior, of course, and there uh, technologies like um, uh, optogenetics, uh, brain clearing techniques to, to look at, at circuits in the adult and others um, and behavioral, uh, very sophisticated behavioral analyses that are being done right now. And the pairing of all of it together is, is enabling uh, really wonderful, exciting strides as well. So. I think we're starting to understand brain function in a way that we could only hope for a few decades ago. Thank you very much. Back to you, Carla. Okay. Um, I have a question for Friedrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, first, I want to make a comment. There are wonderful questions in the Q&A. We're not, I'm sure, going to be able to get to all of them. Um, but one question, uh, first I want to also, Friedrich, uh, send you greetings uh, from Jost Wielmetter, who is here with you today and has Q&A. So I wanna ask a question uh, about the magnificent stripe assay that you developed and of course with your colleagues. And the question is really, how did you come up with the using microfluidics for a stripe assay, you must have been one of the first, if not the first, uh, scientists to apply this kind of beautiful bioengineering method to a biological question. So how did you come up with that assay? I don't remember so well, but uh, I think it was probably due to our experiments in DNA replication where we looked for the uh, mutants which do not synthesize DNA at high temperature at 45 degrees. We also need used at that occasion 
filters for chemical reactions. And that was, uh, so probably, I don't remember the reason why uh, th this came in here. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry that I, I, I should perhaps mention that we try to uh, find the people who were involved at the time. And the, the, the whole thing is 40 years ago. And so it's not so easy to, but especially with the name Jochen Walter, uh, you can't easily find them in, in the, in the uh, net. But uh, the, the, my memory was that we were somehow guided by the experiments on DNA replication and modified it and discussed it that we wanted to have channels uh, and, and suck the membrane extracts onto the uh, channels. So, so thank you for that, because I think it reminds people how coming in and having other disciplines can can be very influential and really aid in your creativity. Yeah, um, right. Josh, back to you. OK, okay. Uh, I'm aware that we are running out of time, and I am open to some guidance from Sarah here. Are there, is there time for more questions? Well, um, one more quick question. Okay, here's a quick question to Corey. Um, so Corey, this is a, a different sort of question. Um, you know, I know that when you were in academia uh, at Stanford and Berkeley, you were very involved in biotech. Um, but then at some point you left academia and made uh, a switch. Um, and I, I think we're one of the first uh, to make that switch. It's a more common path now. And I'm just curious, talk a little bit about what went through your mind when you made what was then a very uh, unusual career move for somebody mm -hmm. who was super successful. Yeah, th th thanks, Josh. Um, you know, what went through my mind is um, it's only one life, um, unless you believe in reincarnation. And, and, and even if I get reincarnated, I might not remember everything I, I studied in this lifetime, right? And um, I want... I wanted to spend, uh, it, there were so many people who had come through my lab and you, you heard me mention just some of them who were doing spectacular work. I knew the field was gonna carry on. I wanted to spend a chapter of my life involved turning great science into impactful medicine. I wanted to make a jump where I, I tried to see whether I could take, take my mind and have an impact on, on medicine and on patients. And I considered many different options. I mean, I considered making a very major switch and staying in academia. Um, but at the time, as you say, I was involved. Um, we had, you know, we, we had already started um, one and then a second company. Actually, the second one is one Mark and I uh, started. And I just thought that the clearer path to do that was to really make a clean switch and to go into biotech. And, um, you know, I'm, 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 Happy to say that, um, you know, first of all, the field has, has progressed incredibly um, without me, and I'm a wonderful cheerleader. I love getting, you know, getting caught up from some of my ex postdocs. And secondly, that there are already drugs on the market saving lives and improving people's lives that I've had a hand in. And it's been a wonderful last, you know, latter chapter of my life to be able to have an impact on human health that way. Thank you. So Sarah, I think back to you. We yep, I'm here. I'm here. I um, I apologize for cutting off the question session, but I am going to move on now. Thank you for the discussion, and bring on our closing speakers, who are just a few special guests to end this on a personal note. I would first like to introduce Peter Salovey, president of Yale University, which is the foundation's home, and chairman of the Gruber Board of Directors. Peter Salovey has been a member of the Gruber Board since we were established at Yale in 2011, and he is the university's 23rd president and the Chris Argeris Professor of Psychology. He is also a personal friend of Mark Tessier Levine, but we have asked him to please be impartial. President Salovey. Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and hello, everyone. And I promise you my remarks will be just as brief as Sarah's introduction, but thank you for that nice introduction. Um, First of all, I just want to offer as the uh, 
chair of the uh, Gruber uh, Board of Directors. Uh, congratulations to our three uh, winners today. I'm a psychologist by background, and so I, uh, as neuroscientists, uh, you're a near neighbor, and I enjoyed uh, listening uh, in on the, uh, on the talks and on the questions. Um, it's really a pleasure to attend these gatherings and to celebrate science, especially in a moment uh, which hopefully has ended, but in a moment that uh, where science uh, isn't uh, trusted by, by everyone in the world and, and uh, uh, an anti-science view was promoted uh, by leaders in this country. And uh, I'm hoping that those days are behind us. And I think it's uh, moments like this where we celebrate fantastic science uh, that uh, uh, allows us uh, to recognize uh, both the, um, the beauty uh, and value and practical implications uh, of scientific uh, work. So the Gruber Foundation uh, fosters educational excellence. Uh, it uh, uh, supports a number of fields and uh, Yale embraces it as its home uh, because uh, uh, part of our mission as a university is to improve the world today and for future generations. That's the, actually the first sentence of our mission statement. And uh, the Gruber uh, uh, Awards Program and the Gruber Science Fellowship uh, are uh, ways in which we can um, reinforce that commitment to improving the world. You know, the Gruber Science Fellowships are actually the most prestigious award offered by Yale's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences to incoming students. Uh, these are offered in the life sciences and cosmology and astrophysics. And uh, I know some of the Gruber Science Fellows uh, in neuroscience are here in attendance uh, today. And uh, uh, when in supporting graduate students, uh, uh, what are we doing? We're nurturing the next generation of groundbreaking scientists. They're the ones who are going to answer, they're going to ask and answer uh, some of the world's most pressing uh, questions. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today and allowing us to celebrate science. I want to congratulate our three neuroscience award winners, and I want to uh, uh, make a special shout out to Mark, uh, who uh, is my uh, colleague as a fellow university president. He's done it twice as often as I have. Uh, both at Stanford and at, and at Rockefeller. And uh, I will just say that uh, uh, in addition to the amazing work that you all heard about today, um, Mark is also a source of incredibly wise counsel, advice, and wisdom uh, to anyone trying to lead a uh, institution of higher education uh, in these uh, challenging uh, times. So. Uh, Again, congratulations to all three of you. Mark, uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you today, uh, especially. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations. Thank you, President Salovey. Let me now present Bill Harris, professor at Cambridge University, to say a few words about Friedrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, professor Christine Holt joins me in congratulating Corey, Mark, and in paying this tribute to Friedrich, one of the most inspiring people that we have ever met in our careers. We will always be grateful to Friedrich for, oh, what, start my video. We will always be grateful to Friedrich for the wonderful year we spent in his lab in Tübingen, just at the time that he developed the extraordinary striped carpet assay that led the world to the efforts. Christine and I recall in wonder that soon after we arrived in Tübingen, Friedrich took us to a darkened room that was filled with computers, tape decks, and hardware, all connected to the most beautiful Zeiss microscope that we'd ever seen. And he told us that he'd set up this equipment to make time-lapse movies of retinal axons growing in the chick brain, but he hadn't got it to work. Maybe, he suggested, we could give it a try with our frog embryos if we liked. Incredibly, it worked and thus began months of shared excitement as we watched growth cones growing live through the brain for the first time. 
At the time, another part of his lab was closing in on the Efrens. It was such an exciting time. But Friedrich is much more than just an amazing scientist. He is also one of the kindest people that Christine and I have ever met. There were countless times that he and his wife, Dorley, helped us and our growing family out at every stage of our memorable year there. And I can assure you that our appreciation for Friedrich's kindness and humanity is widely shared among all those fortunate enough to have had Friedrich for a time in their lives. So please join Christine and me in saluting Friedrich Bonhoeffer, the amazing scientist, discoverer of Sperry's elusive chemoaffinity molecules, and to Friedrich Bonhoeffer, the great human being. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Thank you. <laughs> Let me now present Alex Kolotkin, the Charles J. Holmes C. and Simeon G. Margolis Professor of Neuroscience at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine for a few words about Corey Goodman. Thanks very much, Sarah. I want to extend my heartfelt congratulations to Friedrich, Mark, and Corey for being awarded this year's Gruber Neuroscience Prize. Like all of his many trainees, I owe Corey a debt of gratitude for being invited to participate in a line of innovative research at a time of extremely exciting technical and intellectual upheaval. I first heard Corey speak when I was a graduate student, deeply enmeshed in the analysis of genetic recombination, very far from neuroscience. Corey presented work on grasshopper nervous system pathway labels and also new data on the conservation of arthropod nervous system organization, including flies. The science was captivating, but what I remember most were the beautiful photomicrographs. It was the aesthetic impact of his talk that motivated me to do the work of understanding the significance of Corey's research program. Like many with no neuroscience background, Corey welcomed me into his group and I joined a scientifically diverse collective of outstanding colleagues, a hallmark of Corey's laboratories. The science was exciting, the discoveries continuous, and the work at the forefront of the field. However, it was only after I was an independent investigator that I better appreciated the scope of Corey's work and his vision. About 10 years ago, we were reorganizing a conference room in my department, and I chanced upon the very first issue of the Journal of Neuroscience. One of the articles in this issue is by Corey, and it describes a neuron in the grasshopper embryo that pioneers an axon pathway, but later changes its morphology and connectivity. It was no accident that this study appeared in the very first issue of the Journal of Neuroscience, and we now better understand that these ideas were not initially fully appreciated by the field at large. Corey's drive and dedication were critical for seeing them through. Looking back, the field is very fortunate this line of work blossomed. Of course, there is much more to Corey than his life in academia, be it his current work in the pharmaceutical sector, his talent and love for music, and many, many other interests. But speaking as one among many of his former trainees, I will always have great admiration for Corey's scientific insight, his ability to act on it, and appreciation for his generous and supportive mentoring. Congratulations, Corey, on being recognized for your contributions with this year's Gruber Prize. Thank you. Alex. Let me, Alex, thank you very much. And to you and everyone else who worked in the lab, I mean, I'm really deeply touched. You guys were fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Kolodkin. And let me now present Fan Wang, the Morris N. Broad Distinguished Professor of Neurobiology at Duke University Medical School, for just a few words about Mark Tessier Levine. Dr. Wang. Thank you. Uh, so in Mark's talk, he mentioned uh, Sophia Colomarino, who was one of Mark's first graduate students. Sophia told me that when she was a rotation student, she was trying to decide whether or not she should join Mark's lab. So what she did, she went to ask Psychic. Don't ask me why, knowing Sophia, you will know. So the Psychic went into a trance and came out stunned and told Sophia, You've got to work for this Tessie Levine guy. I saw him as a brilliant celestial deity. True story. So by now, the whole world knows Mark's superhuman capability. Among many things, he is the only Stanford president who runs this enormous prestigious university and maintains an active research lab. It's all started with this heroic purification of a natron. And I remember asking Mark how he had the courage and conviction to risk 
essentially his entire uh, beginning assistant professor's career to pursue the biochemical purification of something completely unknown from 25,000 chick brains, no less. And Mark said, where there's a will, there's a way, plus some really good luck. Then he said to me, Fan, you will have your own lucky breaks one day too. I think for all of us who have had the opportunity to work in Mark's lab, to be guided by him and to have participated in his vision Emmy. and get lifted by him both intellectually and career-wise, that was already one of our luckiest breaks in life. Thank you, Mark, and congratulations from all of your trainees. We're so proud of you. Thank you so much, Fan, and thank you to all of the lab members also. I'm just very, very touched. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And our final words go to our co-founder and president emeritus, Patricia Gruber. Pat? Thank you so much. It bears saying again, congratulations to Dr. Bonhoeffer, Dr. Goodman, and celestial deity, Dr. Tessier Levine. So, as you know, your peers have unanimously selected you for this prize with rigor and with enthusiasm. And you've now heard your colleagues admiringly and affectionately praise your work and your personal selves. We at Gruber, and I'm sure many in the audience, are most grateful to the three of you for giving to the world science deserving of the highest recognition. Speaking personally, as a co-founder and funder, it's a deep satisfaction to see the vision that my late husband and I both shared, to see this vision continue to evolve and flourish at Yale and with the support and collaboration of the Society for Neuroscience and of this very capable team. Again, congratulations to all of you and good day. Thank you, Mrs. Gruber. Everyone join me in applause. For our three recipients, if you have Thank someone you. sitting next to you that would like to wave, maybe a Tobias or a Marsha, they're more than welcome. And thanks to all of our attendees for joining us for the 2020 Gruber Neuroscience Prize. This concludes our program. Thanks to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.